Oh. Hi, everybody. Welcome to week 36 of ENM 2020. Um, yeah, this has been going on for more than half a year now. Um, seems like people are still interested, and you guys set us up with some interesting uh, questions to take on and uh, kind of challenged the instructors to do some focused discussions. So this is the first of those. We'll do a few of them. We're not going to, we're not going to hit a year for this course. Okay. Um, but feel free to suggest uh, topics. You can do this on the Facebook page or on Twitter. Um, feel free to suggest topics for these discussions and, and we'll, we'll try to take them on. Uh, as a first topic, we decided let's look at choosing algorithms. And, you know, so let's, let's just imagine a, a what if scenario. What if um, some interesting species shows up in your country? Okay, just recently in the US, we had the what's called the murder hornet, uh, Vespa mandarinia show up in the northwestern corner of the country. And let's say you and your students or your, or your professors are fascinated with this, or maybe your boss or your, your institute director comes to you and says, um, take this on, tell me what the, the potential of this species is. Whatever the motivation, you want to take on what is the distributional potential of this species in this new region. So. What algorithm do you use? You've just heard months and months and months of discussions of this. Um, if you look at the literature, by far the dominant algorithm would be Maxent. Doesn't mean it's the best or the only, it just means it's the dominant algorithm. My personal experience has been that if you submit a paper these years, <laughs> where you don't use Maxent, the reviewers of your paper basically self-enforce Maxent always being used. But I think there's a much more complex and nuanced answer to this question. So what do you do? Mona, you get this, <laughs> sorry to interrupt your coffee. Uh, you get, or tea probably, right? You're still, you're still on the correct side. Uh, you get a you get a interesting new species that you and your students want to take on. Mm -hmm. What algorithm or algorithms do you use, and why? Well, I'm I'm still stuck in the um, uh, this problem of if I don't have absence data, should I use algorithms that are that were I think originally designed designed for logistic, you know, yes, no, presence, absence situation. So I do default to, I used to, when I was in grad school, uh, GARP and, and then Maxent. So I do default to um, either presence background or presence only. Um, and I, I, yeah, it's, <laughs> my, my graduate students do uh, run multiple um, algorithms, including presence, absence with presence only data. And by presence only data, I mean, you know, download GBIF presence records. Uh, so that, that's my limitation there. I still haven't been able to pass that mental block that I have that if I don't have absence data, why am I, you know, why am I running a GLM? Okay, so. I, I really like that logic because what you've done is you've taken a conceptual framework and you've used the conceptual framework to guide the decisions you're making methodologically. It does cut down your options very massively. <laughs> you know, these days, it basically takes you to Maxent. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a very solid logic. And it's not a, it's not a weakness, right? <laughs> that's, that's a good way of doing it in my, in, from my point of view. Like if you have data, why don't you rely on what you have mm -hmm. uh, then decide what to use? 
Okay, Enrique, are you there? Okay, he shows up as here. Yes, but that... yes. Oh, there he is. So, Enrique, there's a new invasive species that has showed up in the extreme northwest of Mexico. You and your students really want to take on modeling this species. What algorithm do you use and why? I would, I would use different ones. And uh, I would test as many as I could, as I know, at the, well, as long as I know how they work, I will test all of them and see if, if one of them works better or if an ensemble modeling works better. Get closer to your microphone, Enriquito, please. Uh, hold on. Yeah, we can't hear you over the dog barking. Uh, Town, I need an, another computer, so uh, please. It's better, it's better now, Enrique. <laughs> Come and get one I, the way I did with the camera. <laughs> I have another paper behind, so if I hurry up, can you give me another computer time? <laughs> Enrique, if I were to give you a computer for every, com every paper that you have that is behind, you'd have a house full of computers. That's great. That's a good, a good deal. <laughs> so could you please answer the question? Well, I, I already did. I, I would use as many as I could, but I think it's, it's very important not, not only using many algorithms, it's, it's understanding what the algor algorithms do. Okay, given your understanding, if you don't have absence data, true absence data, are you going to use that family of methods that, re that originally requires uh, originally required absence data to contrast with presence data? Uh, well, since this is an invasive species and we don't have any, any uh, previous work on that species or, or in any uh, like close, close uh, relative of that species in Mexico, I probably would avoid those algorithms that use true absences because I wouldn't trust uh, generating pseudo absences without any any logic or for example random pseudo absences. I would rather if I know something about uh, if there were some sampling before or something I could use that as, as pseudo absences. But uh, in this case, in this particular case, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do any, any presence, true absence algorithm, probably, yeah. Okay, you looked like you were eager to talk. Well, I have an opinion. My opinion is that uh, what algorithm depends on the question. So if you are, if you want to do, for instance, and this is a, a valid Thing. you want to characterize an actual area of distribution, you may use one of the complicated methods that do regression and are, are very sort of... Uh, convoluted. Convoluted. But if you want to extrapolate or transfer to a mm -hmm. different time or different space, you better avoid those uh, algorithms that fit the data too closely because mm -hmm. you are by definition going beyond the data. Yep. So um, that would be my, my, my first question. What I am trying to do? What's my question? What's my problem? Uh, now, you can, you can use, uh, and then of course is a question of whether you have absence or, or, or only presence data because it's a big difference. Uh, but then Maxent, I don't mind because Maxent fits ellipsoids and um, I, I like ellipsoids a lot. I prefer to do ellipsoids myself so I understand what it's doing. But Maxent in general, Maxent fits what I, are called um, conic um, bodies of revolution. So maybe ellipsoids, com convex, nice or they may be paraboloids, or they may be hyperboloids. Paraboloids and hyperboloids don't make any biological sense. 
ellipsoids do make biological sense. So I prefer to go to a method that nobody uses, which is Mahalanobis picking ellipsoids, because I understand what it's doing and because I um, because they make biological sense, the shape that you will get. And those are the two reasons. I don't have statistical reasons. I know that the, the statistically minded people wouldn't accept this as valid reasons. But I think uh, knowing what you are doing, understanding, feeling in your bones what you are doing, and, and getting as a result something that makes biological sense is preferable uh, to, to get um, some, some very high number that describes uh, performance. Enrique. Teacher, miss, can I, can I speak? <laughs> Please speak. Thank you. Well, my, my only problem with uh, ellipsoids is that they assume uh, a Gaussian distribution or, or of the response of the species with the environmental variables. And, and that normally is a problem. Yeah. Yeah, one sure. thing is convex and another thing is Gaussian. Yes, symmetric. I, in, in my own mind, my next step in modeling is to start modeling convex shapes that are not symmetric. Uh -huh. and, yeah. and there is already one paper describing how to do it, not by me, but by somebody else. And uh, yeah, that would be my next step, going moving beyond symmetric platonic ellipsoids to, to shapes that are more like, uh, I don't know. Like egg-shaped. Yeah, egg-shaped. So, Jorge, nonetheless, in the paper that you and I and others just submitted, Marlon as well, um, we used Maxent. Yes, we did. Why? <laughs> well, it's been uh, to avoid referees getting to the roof, yeah. basically. Yeah. It's, it's really, really interesting. You know, I'm, I'm remembering back to Narayani Barve's uh, first thesis chapter, where she did some really cool stuff, taking physiological measurements and relating them to long-term weather data, very dense temporal sampling of conditions. It had nothing to do with correlative ecological niche modeling. She submitted it. I think it was the Global Ecology and Biogeography. It reviewed quite well, but one of the reviewers said, where's the Maxent model? Yeah, that's- And we answered back to the reviewer, gave a good logic that this was about physiology and, and scaling of time and space, and it wasn't about a correlative model. And the reviewer said, great, thank you for the revisions but where's the Maxent model? And in the end, Narayani had to choose, do I add in this model that doesn't really fit with the theme of the paper so that the paper can be accepted? She did it, boom, it was accepted. So I think this is kind of a call to the reviewer community to be smarter than just, well, everybody uses Maxent, why don't you? Marlon, what do you think? You wrote a, a, a neat package that's being adopted very broadly for work with Maxent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, which is not a criticism. <laughs> it's okay. I'm doing the same thing for other algorithms because like, I am tired that a lot of people is just using them without calibrating models. Uh, ah. It's gonna take a lot of time, but I'm gonna do it someday. I'm gonna finish someday. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's very interesting, you know, a lot of the platforms, including some that have been treated in this course, a lot of the platforms that are doing, you know, kind of multi-model comparison, they're just doing default parameter or, you know, or single setting parameter uh, model estimation. And so essentially they're using you know, the sampling of solution space, they're using different algorithms, but without any tuning. Whereas KUENM and ENM, eval and, and platforms like that are using parameter variation within one algorithm. 
But the real world of model to model variation is different parameter settings and different algorithms. And I don't think anybody's that, doing that. You call that fine tuned max sense, right? Uh, I don't know. I call it calibration because it's a more statistical general term. But tuning is a, it's a term that is being not if not adopted, at least uh, mentioned in the field and it's being used. I think calibration is the, the real, the real uh, term, no? I think it is statistically at least yeah. in terms of modeling. But uh, like, that was in the question. I think my, my opinion about like what, what algorithm to use is it, it's related to all what you have said. And that's why I was making notes because I think like at least four interesting questions have been have been uh, mentioned and I'm going to read them. So the first thing it was, uh, do I have absences? And I think I will ask myself that. The other one is, uh, do I understand how the algorithm works? And I think that's a very important one because if I do understand the algorithm, I can do a lot more with my modeling exercise. Sure. I, I, I understand what what how the uh, records are using are used <clears throat> how the variables uh, need to be selected and need to be treated <clears throat> and sometimes what kind of variables can i include uh, i know how to calibrate the model how to calibrate the the exercise and for example um, also like i know what's the effect of doing something if i understand the algorithm I know what's the effect of including more uh, responses or features or variables or uh, excluding records or partition records. And, and I think that's very important. So that's the second question. And the third, the third question is what, what Jorge mentioned is what, I'm try, what am I trying to model? Which is to say, if I am under, and interested in the distribution of a very well known species that has been sampled a lot, Probably I don't want uh, two simple models, but rather something that characterizes very well the environments used. And probably I will have absences for that species or something close to absences. So it's going to be interesting. And the last one is, well, is, is the algorithm well known or at least accepted by the community? <laughs> Which will be, uh, it, I mean, this is this is not necessarily correct, but it's 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 true. Like if you're trying to do a good exercise and nobody knows the algorithm, probably even your methods are going to be very messy to write and, and stuff like that. So I, I think we're going to, we're going to confront that latter question. Um, for example, as Laura Jimenez finishes up her methodology, where if you want to estimate a convex shape, you should be using and, and take into account, um, incomplete representation of environments across an M area, you should be using this new method and it's not max N, oops. And it's not one of the accepted, you know, canon of algorithms, oops. And so it's gonna be really interesting in coming years to start using that algorithm and say, this is the appropriate algorithm for this question. So I'm not going to use MaxN and I'm not going to use GLM. I'm going to use this one. In fact, we have, since we are heavy users of MaxN, we have been discovering little quirks and little problems to the algorithm and, uh, or, to the, or to the implementation, uh, which is the, the uh, I, I believe that a lot of people use Maxen mostly because the implementation is very clever and well designed. That's right. But so another another the, piece are, of it is the user interface. Is it easy? The user interface makes it so easy to 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 produce models that uh, you start. I mean, in thirty seconds you are producing models, right? So. It, that that's a big plus for Maxen, but we have been discovering regularly little problems to Maxent, which are not so little. And we have not had the time to start publishing or anything, but uh, yeah, I think Maxent will eventually more or less either become 
more transparent because there are implementations or just cease to be used. What about ensembles? Why don't you talk a little bit about ensembles? So here's where I'd love to have Gengping Zhu uh, involved in the discussion. Um, Gengping did some very, very interesting work, is doing some very interesting work, where he looks at ensembles versus individual models. And what he's shown pretty clearly is that if you have an ensemble that performs well, then there's always an individual model that performs better. For transferring. For whatever. You know, if, you have a way, if you have a way of evaluating the, the model objectively and saying, you know, this is a six and this is a 2.3 and this is a four, then the ensemble is an average and it includes the really good and the really bad or the really good and the fairly good models. And so what Geng Ping has shown in several papers is that that averaging pulls you away from the worst, but it also pulls you away from the best. Sure. That... Go ahead, Enrique. Try unmuting yourself. That's right. Go, Jorge. Sorry. Go ahead. No, uh, I was just going to say that, that that goes without saying any average, it's, it's an average. But, right. uh, but the problem, the real problem is that you don't know what algorithm is going to be better or the best. So that you have to have a way of evaluating which is the best. Well, I, I think there are different ways of ensembling and there are bad ways of ensembling and there are better ways of ensembling. And I think I'm not a fan of of ensembles, but, but it's not only a, a, a simple mean, it could be a weighted mean. That's, that's mm -hmm. one way of, of doing, and, and you, you can do a pre-selection of the best models based on an individual evaluation of the models and then ensemble those. Mm -hmm. But one problem that I see conceptually in the ensembles is that some of the algorithms the output is something related to the probability of presence. Some others is the suitability index. Some others is an ensemble of ensembles. So you are mixing oranges with apples. And salamanders and cannonballs. Yeah. Uh, it, it's yeah. not that's a big problem with ensembles. Yeah, that's a problem with ensembles. So my, my way of doing ensembles is degrading actually the information, binarizing the output of continuous algorithms, because in that way you are comparing things that are modeling presence and absence. Mm -hmm. I understand that that, that uh, has a drawback because you are degrading the, the original information and you are losing what is inside of the, of the potential distribution. But I think that's the only way that you can compare uh, apples with apples. I think so as well. I agree. <clears throat> it's, I think that's at least a way to avoid this kind of mixing uh, different information. Uh, and I don't see uh, like a huge problem in degrading the models that way because models are not specifically good in detecting what's more suitable and less suitable. Those kind of differences are not generally very good in any of the correlative niche modeling algorithm. Have, have you had, sorry Tom, have, ahead, you, have you made the exercise of, of doing a correlation analysis between the outputs of different algorithms? I have, but not two, two different algorithms. I have done GLMs and Maxim when they have similar features. Uh -huh. and it, it's really good. It's not perfect, but it's good. I did one to Bioclean, Maxim, uh, Garp, and something else. I have done that, and they yeah. don't relate at all. Almost. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's worth, it's worth... There, there, there are bands, right? I mean, there's a lot of scatter, but they can... And, and you know, someone did that once, uh, our old friends, uh, uh, Jane Elliott and, and Kevin Graham, 
and they it is published and they found a lot of scatter. Mm -hmm. It's worth it's worth thinking about where ensembles came from. You know, when I think it was Araujo uh, proposed ensemble. Climatic, climatic models. Yeah. yeah, and he was explicitly referring to to you know climate modeling where you have different simulations of of earth atmosphere and geosphere and and hydrosphere processes and you know you can imagine you know setting up teams of physicists around the world and climatologists who create these simulations but the outputs are all in you know degrees kelvin and they're they're all explicitly in the same yeah, the same thing yeah and and so the thing was you didn't really know which algorithm was better in which way you know maybe one handled you know water cycles better than a, another and another handled energy cycles better and maybe one was much better tuned for australia versus asia and so really you were you were combining apples with apples because you explicitly didn't have any way of deciding which was better in a in a you know for for anticipating the future of climate on earth well i don't i mean for a bunch of reasons i don't think that niche models are the same which is to say enrique made a good point about combining apples and oranges they're very different things that come out. And, you know, again, the idea of averaging, regardless of whether it's a weighted average or a, or a, a crude average, you're still including for any given pixel, there's a different prediction in each model and it might be better or worse. And you are diluting the average down, you're, you're diluting the best down to the average. And so, there's, a, there's another kind of option that comes into this, which in some sense is an ensemble. And this is, we've talked about this in the course. This is the no free lunch uh, idea. And here, you know, yeah, you'd run a whole bunch of models with a whole bunch of algorithms, but you would evaluate them to figure out which was the best. This is a project led by Hui Jie Chiao. Um, you would you would figure out which is the best might be maybe by holding back some data and doing a model uh, testing exercise and you'd see oh look this model for this species and this environmental data set this particular algorithm is the best and you would use that so that doesn't sound like an ensemble but what it is is a is it's a weighted ensemble in which the weights are one for the best single or multiple models, if there's a tie, and zero for the rest. So it is in, sense, in a sense a weighted ensemble, just a very severely weighted ensemble. Yeah. So I think what we come down to again is, what do you know about the algorithms? What do you know about the species? Do you have enough information to do an empirical evaluation of which is best. If you do, then I would look towards something like uh, something like a, a no free lunch approach. If you don't, then I would look to an ensemble, but I like very much Enrique's idea of if they don't estimate the same thing, then convert them into the same thing so that they estimate similar things. Well, in some sense, you know, in some sense, that's what you do when you combine the outputs, because the outputs are just numbers. And as long as you scale them similarly, you are combining a bunch of numbers and uh, well, you know, what, one thing is to scale them all from from zero to a hundred, you know, maximum and minimum. Uh, but a very different thing would be to to essentially use to use omission error uh, to to scale them, and that's what you do when you threshold them, when you binarize them. You're essentially, I assume, using 
a, an omission error based minimum training presence approach. Mm -hmm. And so you're essentially allowing omission error to scale where is the breakpoint between presence and absence, right? I think that's better than just rescaling from, you know, all of them from zero to a hundred. Because you don't know, you know, one of them might be very loaded at the extremes and another one might be very Gaussian. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of the problems that the outputs mean different things. When you rescale them, you are getting a hodgepodge that you mentioned. You are mixing bicycle with bacon and with crocodiles. We're going to have breakfast with town. He's going to have breakfast. Are you going to cook us some, fix us some, some eggs? <laughs> I want bacon and eggs. Now you're muted. Or even you're better, chorizo I, and eggs. Yeah. I take a 20 second break and, and, and you guys are already planning breakfast. Come on, Kate, get the other end. Sorry. No, I was going to say that uh, the problem of mixing different uh, outputs of, like, sorry, outputs of, outputs of different algorithms That's becomes right. even uh, bigger when you're doing projections to different areas or different scenarios because extrapolation in different algorithms are managed differently. For some of them, like there's no extrapolation, and for others, there is little extrapolation, safe extrapolation, and for others, it's, it can be really, really bad. Like Maxent, if you leave it extrapolating freely or with clamping, sometimes you can get really crazy things with the species loving 300 degrees of temperature, for instance. Uh, so it, it's even more risky that way. Uh, that's why it needs to be done carefully. And, and that's why I also said like what Enrique is doing is not, it's not degrading information. I think it's doing the same thing. Yeah. So let me ask all of you a question. Do you guys think that the average user of Maxent um, bothers about the meaning of the parameters and tweaking the parameters properly and understand what's going on or not really? I think they do. They do now. You know, but average user, you know, yeah, if you're if you're doing something that's not even for publication and you're just, you know, pulling up the Maxent GUI and, and slopping out some models. Yeah, but if people are looking to publish their work, I think reviewers by and large now are enforcing the idea of some sort of model selection, some sort of tweaking the parameters or tuning the model. I, I think that uh... It depends on the platform that that users are using. If it's like KUENM or Wallace, you need to know that there is some tuning. But if you are using a standalone uh, interface, most people don't go into the into the settings or the advanced settings. Don't pull out all the so, okay. I, I think it depends. Okay. I think most people now are, are, are turning to, to VR platforms. Okay. Last one. Which is good. But I'm 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 sure most of the users don't don't understand how it works. I don't understand how it works uh, precisely. How how is the numbers being uh, you know manipulated inside so, so, because it's it's complicated in terms of mathematics, and if you don't have fact, the, the the code for Maxent was not open. Yeah. Now there are, are versions, but uh, in, in fact, in fact, all the all the problem with what is regularization and how it manages those things is very opaque in the papers. Yeah, That's the entire I, I thing was very opaque. The first papers by Phillips. You couldn't even know what a, a probability of what was yeah. being uh, estimated. Then it came later papers by Elith and by and may, mostly, mostly by Cory Merrill. Right. Cory Merrill yeah. really clarified stuff. But even but, so, it's it's a probability of what, given this list of assumptions, <clears throat> which are 
usually uh, violated. Uh, it's not a well-defined probability. Yeah. Mona, you are very quiet. You are, Mona. So, well, because you're having a good conversation, I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> Go ahead, Mona. Oh, I, I was going to agree with with uh, with Enrique that the interface. I think you know when Max Sand came out um, in early two thousands, um, everybody was excited that it's you know it's a mathematical model, it's a probability Gibbs probability distribution, and you know the interface was clean. But I think the fact that we have, you know, intermediate and advanced options, I can't remember the, you know, the, the, the tabs. Um, if, if you remember way back when we were in grad school, Enrique, we had, you know, the GARP interface that had all the, all the options in just one, you know, one window. You couldn't escape uh, the parameters. Whereas in the, in the user-friendly interface, the GUI interface, uh, those those advanced options are the user has to click and and learn about the algorithm um, but I, I don't think you know so the early inter implementation in like this small package I remember my my former student Shao he was he was trying to to change parameters to run maxent under this small and many of the uh, of the options that you actually have in the Java interface were not, you know, you could not change parameters uh, in, in the R implementation. So, yeah, so it's even, yeah, even if you know what you're doing, sometimes you, you know, depending on the implementation, you don't have access to all the, all the parameters. And the other thing that I was thinking about when you talked about um, ensemble, my uh, ensemble modeling um, and merging models, I agree, bicycles and bacon and, I don't know, apples. Um, it's, it's a big problem. I like, I like the um, suggestion or the, the, implement, the approach you have, Enrique, and I use that too. I just threshold the models. Um, it's very worrisome that to this day, <laughs> we see, we see um, papers averaging probabilities or, or summing Whenever I see sum of probabilities, I just I just <laughs> lose my my cool my my patience because um, this is where we take some what we think is an index of suitability, oh, yeah. but we don't care what the unit is. So if it is a probability of yeah, right. suitability, then clearly you cannot just sum probabilities. Um, you know, it's are you yeah it's. Are you after a probability? Um, a, are you after a, an event occurring alone or two events occurring together? That's you know that's the probability. So you don't sum probabilities when you want A and B to happen at the same time. So um, I mean this. I remember I had this conversation when I was a postdoc, and I was trying to convince someone that you cannot just sum probabilities if you. If you are, this is not ensemble, this is two different species. So if you are, if you are looking for the, the pixel where both species A and species B could occur, and you have a probability of occurrence, uh, don't sum them up, you have to multiply because it's, you are in the probability theory now. And the person was telling me, well, but then the, but then the value <laughs> drops. <laughs> and I'm like, well, <laughs> of course it drops because it's now two events. So I, I think we, we just brush over details. We think they are just details, but they are, they are huge. Yeah, they are important details. What is that 0 0.3 value? What does it mean? Is it a probability value? Is it, what is it? So don't just sum average yeah, it's anyways, so that's my rant. <laughs> but one thing that maybe uh, our listeners should be aware of is that we more or less, all of us, belong to a school of doing this that um, it's very, very choosy about and very peculiar about getting those conceptual details right. And there are other schools that don't care too much about meanings and that sort of thing. And, and they just care about having a, a number cruncher that produce nice cute maps with the figures and that's enough. 
and I mean, you can go very long, very, I mean, you can get very, very long ways using the, that, that approach because you can get papers published all the time. Our method, our philosophy, it's less conducive to producing tons of papers because we are more fastidious about uh, having the ideas right and a way of doing things. That, that means that the yeah, time is only a, a number cruncher because he publishes. Um, well, yes, Tom is an outlier, a generalized <laughs> outlier. But, but Enrique, you only publish when people give you computers. Come on. Right. Yeah, that's and in fact, people give you computers and even then you don't publish. <laughs> that's I, the trick. I do, I do want to make one last comment before this devolves completely. <laughs> um, yeah, one thing is, you've, you know, the people who are listening to this are probably getting the point that this group of people is really focused on getting the conceptual framework right as a way of guiding what algorithms do you choose, how do you process your, your data after doing the modeling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think there's a there's also a, a kind of a a more general point to make. You know, let's say that you take into account all those considerations of what kind of data do I have and what kind of response am I trying to estimate. And I realize no, max n k u e n m that's the way to go. Right? Let's just imagine that. You can feed your data into and make all the right settings and get out at the end of KUENM what is basically the, the, the raw material for a final figure in your paper. You get out a table that you can plop in as your, your table two. You get out a, a summary raster which, which gives you uh, the combination of the, the uh, the best models. I really think there's a lot more thinking that needs to go in there. So let's say you're met, you're, you're, you have three best models. A lot of people don't look at each of those three models individually. And let's say that maybe you get just one, mo one best model or a few best models do you ever look at the models that are slightly less than best? You know, what, the ones that have the delta AIC value of 2.001. Look at those. And your response as a scientist should be very different if those models are wildly different or closely similar to what you got out of the algorithm. And my point is simply, and this is not just about KUENM and MaxN. My point is, get in there and play. You know, all four of you know me. I am not a technological wonder, right? Mona had to fight with me to get to transition from ArcView to ArcMap. And Marlon had to hold my hand a few months ago so that I could get a KUENM model calibration done. And Jorge makes fun of me extensively for everything that I don't do and can't do. In our? In anything. But <laughs> here, here's the point. The point is, when this model selection stuff came up, I kind of got interested in it. I'd, <laughs> I'd reviewed the Warren and Seifert paper in, what, 2012? And I thought, geez, we got to play with this. And so when we started playing with it, it was by hand. And so it was, you know, let's take this model on default parameters. <laughs> Sorry, the girls are building a fort right now. I don't want to know what my office looks like. But we literally took the default parameter, you know, regularization parameter equals one by default. And we said, let's do 1.2 and 0.8. Let's do two and one half. Let's do 10 and one tenth. And so we did 
actually a couple of papers doing these parameterization exercises by hand. And obviously, it's way easier now, and I'm, I'm never going to do that again. But I learned really cool lessons because I did it by hand. And I could tell you 30 things. And Enrique and I, do you remember way back, just when the mastodons were going extinct, Enrique, at the end of the Pleistocene, do you remember that you and I took a GARP model yeah. and implemented it rule by rule and reconstructed the prediction? In Excel, yeah, it was, it was. It was horrible, but we did it. We did. So, you know, that's no, that's no claim to fame. I'm an idiot. I don't do R, I don't do Python, I don't do any of these platforms, not calling you an idiot, Mana. Plus um, plus. Right, but <laughs> get in there and play with your science results. Don't just look at the summary statistic or the, the final raster. Understand what the structure of the data looks like. Understand what the effects of those parameters is. You know, I know if I change R, the regularization parameter in MaxEnt, and if I change it to a higher value, I know that I get smoother results. Don't make a mess, please. Oh my God, I've got to end this session because I don't know. I mean, they've, they've been grabbing hair ties, blankets, You're sheets. Not in the, the, the they have grabbed dumbbells for exercise. It's going to be a disaster in there. But get in there and play with the results that come out of whatever program or platform you use. It matters. Yeah. And it'll make you do better science as a result. I have two motions. Two motions. We... Emotions or motions? Second, motions. second, second your motions. I, third your motions. I don't even know what they are. Thank you. Thank you because one but of my But now I vote no because I don't know what they are. Is, is that Jorge teach us the new method for, for evaluating uh, models that Laura, Laura, she, Laura invented? Yeah, that's right. Yes. I want to understand that very well. Jorge. You could do that as a, as a, a last piece of the course next week, Jorge. Yeah, would be great. Um, do, we have, do we have a vote? There are four of us who are not Jorge. Vote yes or no? Yes? Yes. <laughs> I'm not no. Gonna do vote it. no. Any abstentions? <laughs> the paper is not yet published. It so? is. I already saw it in methods. There, there, is a pre, there is a pre thing over there on the, on the, uh, in the, online but not yet well published but the method is already established you have a, 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 a guy uh, what <laughs> github uh, or you you can download and uh, and we need to understand it well we want the premise <laughs> it's up to you jorge you can blow it off or you can be responsible you choose why, why don't we invite lara and, and she can that's what i was going to say yeah, between the two of, of you. And that, that my second motion is okay. that we we have Marlon here. We okay. can resuscitate GARP, but with the new algorithms and use the, the genetic algorithm GARP is on top dead. of the others. GARP is a black box. Never liked it because well, but, but black box we, we have the magician here that can make it open the black box. <laughs> I have to finish my dissertation, you know. What is inside the black yeah, box is what you, what you mentioned. All the, all, all the decisions that the very old garb gave you and the new desktop garb hide from you. And so very black boxy. I think that now, I mean, well, I have my opinions about uh, garb. Yeah, it, it, historically, it was very important. We all used it. It was very extremely important but it's been superseded by other things no 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 garb uh, specifically exactly how it was a, a new a new version of a genetic algorithm which is an ensemble modeling actually but with different uh, hmm. approaches behind it garb was an ensemble that's right yeah nice. yeah and, um, you know now that we're talking about motions uh, why don't you invite Hannah to, to talk about niche evolution?
that's something that we missed. Didn't we, didn't we do anything on niche evolution? I don't think so. Oh, God. I think what we should do is a year from now, when I've forgotten how much work this course was, <laughs> we should probably do another course on distributional ecology, <clears throat> which is to say, forget about how you do the models. What are the big science questions and how do you address them? For that, we need to finish the island by your geography project. That also, that also. Anyhow, well, okay. The questions. I'm going to go ahead and end this session for the public. Um, so thanks, Jorge, Mona, Enrique, and Marlon. Hope to see you back next week for further discussions. Um, people out there in the in the ENM 2020 community. Uh, put things on the Facebook page or on Twitter and give me your suggestions about a topic for next week. Otherwise, I'll decide it or the instructors can suggest it. Um, but, you know, give us, give us what's interesting and we'll try to take it on. So we that's all. Question 307, it was very interesting. Next time. Okay, next time. Uh, see you all next week. And thanks for showing up.